I've often wondered why koi carp is so expensive, but not really looked into it until recently when I heard that the world's most expensive live fish have been sold at auction for $1.8 million or $1.4 million. Pounds. Okay, but that's just ridiculous. How on earth can a fish be worth that much? It was time for me to try and find out. My name is Carl Smith and as an angler I get to see fish all the time and the different species and their behaviours are fascinating. I also keep fish at home, in a tank, but also in my pond. I've got a little goldfish which I bought for £2 and also a few koi carp costing around £35 to £50 each. Now I love my koi and they are very beautiful but why the huge difference in price? The story of the koi starts with the wild carp of Asia. The Japanese called these wild carp magoi. The colourful varieties of koi that exist today originated in the Yamakoshi Mountains, where residents noticed natural colour mutations in the normally brown magoi. They originally kept carp as an alternative food source as they could grow rice and keep carp in pools of a similar nature. When these black or brown magoi showed signs of colour mutation, the most colourful specimens were selectively bred to produce fish with more vibrant and varied colours. The Japanese named these colourful carp nishikigoi, which translates to swimming or living jewel. In Japan, koi are considered a symbol of love and friendship, and last year were recognised as the national fish of the country. We can't be sure exactly when the selective breeding of koi first began, but what we do know is that they grew in popularity around the 1900s when they were exhibited in Tokyo for the first time. This signalled the start of fish keepers valuing koi across the world. To find out more and delve a little bit deeper into the world of these colourful carp, I decided to book myself onto a koi purchasing trip with an aquatics retailer. Now I had absolutely no intention of actually buying a fish, besides they are ever so expensive, but the trip would be my way of getting to see the koi breeding facilities up close and begin to understand why these fish are valued so highly. After some research, I found Wesley, who runs Causeway Koi. A phone call later and I was booked onto the trip and very much looking forward to the adventure. I'm Wesley Stewart and I'm a koi dealer. I have a shop called Causeway Koi, which is in Portrush on the north coast of Northern Ireland. Our flight was from London to Tokyo. Although arriving at the airport, we were quite concerned about the storm raging outside. Many flights were cancelled, including the ones before and after hours. Our plane was delayed and that gave us the chance to get to know Wesley and his customers who were joining us on this trip. Okay, so there's a uh, guy that's quite local to us here. Uh, Chris, is, he's coming on the trip. And we had Cormac and Sean from the Republic of Ireland coming as well. They could ask me to get the fish for them, but for a lot of people, it's an aspiration to go to Japan. It's the birthplace of the hobby. Eventually, the call came. The flight is actually gonna go. Let's go. <laughs> we boarded and then took off in strong winds, which made for a nerve wracking, bumpy ride. Flight time was around 11 hours and I actually slept most of the way. Um, no doubt dreaming of the biggest and most impressive carp in the world. We had arrived in Tokyo, Japan's capital city. This is the most densely populated city in the world, with 38 million people living within the Tokyo metropolitan area. That's more than four times the population of Greater London, or equal to Los Angeles and New York added together. Surprisingly though, the city is not overrun with cars and has an incredibly low crime rate and the streets are very clean. Now I'm someone who enjoys a bit of peace and quiet and that's probably why I gravitated towards fishing and the outdoors. So for me, Tokyo was a little bit overwhelming. That said, there were small glimpses of calm within the city. Intricate gardens simulating the mountainous, wild part of Japan. I've been interested in the Japanese gardens since I did a school project about them when I was 14. 
it was amazing that after all those years, I've now got my chance to see them for real. Of course, koi carp are synonymous with Japanese gardens, and there are a few on display in these city ponds. Our time in Tokyo had just the right balance of historic Japanese culture mixed with the excitement of an almost futuristic city. However, it wasn't the crowds, lights, music, or even the gardens that I had come for, it was Koi. So Wesley guided us to a train destined for Ojia in the northwest of Japan. Ojia is a city close to the Yamakoshi Mountains where the Koi carp originated and somewhere that I really wanted to visit. My first point of call was Nishikigoi no Sato, or the Koi Village. This is a museum dedicated to educating people about Koi. This is actually incredible. They are so beautiful to watch, so calm and docile, probably more so than any other fish. I've seen a lot of different species in aquariums, uh, tanks and ponds, but the Koi carp is definitely the most gracious and gentle of all of them. Of course, I was super excited to see so many big and colorful koi so early in my trip. A particularly memorable fish being a large brown one, which was especially greedy. Whilst at the museum, I had learned that to breed a quality koi carp, the selection process is long and difficult. For every valuable fish, there are hundreds of thousands with little or no value. The skill of the breeders is to pick out the healthiest and most promising baby fish grow on. So I'm here at the Koi Museum in Ojia. I haven't been in this city for too long but I've already noticed that these fish aren't just pets to the people who live here. For a lot of them these carp are their livelihood. Almost every shop we've been to, every restaurant, cafe, the lot, there's pictures of koi on the walls. They paint them, they, they have stickers of koi everywhere. It certainly seems like the koi carp is a very dominant aspect of the people's life here and that is why we're going to be visiting the breeders, the very people who make these fish up in the mountains tomorrow. Before leaving the museum I noticed this chart indicating how cross-breeding different attributes over time produce the different varieties of koi. I was now very excited for the next day's adventure. We checked into our hotel room before going for a meal at a characterful little restaurant. <laughs> to gain access to the koi breeders' ponds, Wesley had acquired some help from a man called Martin. Well, I've been coming to Japan since 1981, but in 2001, I started a company with my colleague Rene Villia called Japan Koi Export. And we specialize in bringing people to Japan to select koi from the breeders and the farms. And then we ship them uh, to their destinations around the world. Rene and Martin picked us up in the morning and we traveled up as a group into the mountains. The first destination was Hosakai Koi Farm, which Wesley knows well and has visited many times. I was so excited to finally step foot in a koi breeder's workplace. These pools are where the fish are kept over winter, where they are safe and warm, away from predators and icy conditions. These ponds also offer a perfect place to display the fish to potential buyers like Wesley. Well, of course, I was expecting to see a lot of koi in Japan, but not quite this many. As Hosakai made drinks for the group, Wes netted a fish, placing it into a bowl to get a closer look. As you can imagine, it's easy to get carried away and buy fish from the off. 
but there are over 100 koi breeders in Nagata Prefecture and we intended to visit a few more of them before deciding on to purchase any fish. <laughs> to my amazement, I actually learned there are over 100 different varieties of koi, so I won't list them all now, but here is a brief introduction. There are Asagi, with a blue body and red base of the pectoral fins. Deutz, a German carp with no or very few scales. Ogon, a one-color koi which most regularly comes in yellow or white. Tancho, a white fish with a red circle on its head, similar to that of the Japanese flag. Chagoi, which are light brown. And Shisui, which are a cross between the Asagi and the Deutz. Of course, I was curious about the most expensive varieties of koi. The varieties Kohaku, Sanki and Showa are in a group known as Gosanki. These are fish which can compete for the title of Grand Champion in a koi show. But we'll look at koi shows a little later in this film. It was only our first full day in Nagata and we had seen so much. I think my first impressions were that the area was very clean, the locals were polite. That was a conversation with a robot. Doors and cars were very small and toilets were rather technical. We popped into 7-Eleven for some lunch and were surprised by the unusual choice of foods. Strawberry sandwiches, amongst other things, were not what I was used to. My second item of lunch, biggest fish finger in the world. Look at that. It's not fish. <laughs> We visited a range of different koi breeders over the next three days and one thing that struck me was the vast quantity of fish in what were relatively small pools. Martin explained to me that these fish only spend a short amount of time in these ponds. As soon as the snow melts and the weather improves, the fish are released into mud ponds. These are larger, clay-built ponds which provide a perfect home for koi where they can feast on natural food like crayfish and bloodworm. The Japanese have learnt that the fish grow bigger and healthier if you give them the space and water quality provided by these mud ponds. I saw so many of these mud ponds scattered through the mountain valleys and in fact one of the breeders that we visited, Marisei, is the largest producer of koi carp in the area and that one breeder has over 1,000 mud ponds. say if I bought one that, at that place? You can say I don't, I don't give it a price, you know, I sell it up on 20. <laughs> no words, please buy one. You want me to? I'm tempted, man, I'm tempted. I'm tempted by the Matsuba, but also the Chagoy. Chagoy, yeah, that special Chagoy. I'd now seen a fair few koi breeders, but up next was a place where I'd see some much bigger and much more expensive fish. So this is Dainichi Koi Farm. I'm not entirely sure whether I've got the pronunciations right, but this is apparently one of the top three koi farms in the whole of Japan. And I think I can see why. We just looked into a couple of the first pools and we've seen bigger koi than I've ever seen before in my life. These things are wide. We're leaving. Are we oh, off? Yeah. Okay. And we're going to the big house. Okay. Where the big fish are. No, shut up. Huh? They're the big fish. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know why you're Bigger going. ones? We're now going to the bigger ones. Danichi Koi Farm is responsible for numerous grand champion show winning fish. And their pond of Jumbo Kahaku was very impressive to say the least. I overheard that some of the fish in this pond actually cost over 400,000 pounds each. 
but why were those fish so much more expensive than the ones we'd seen in the previous ponds? This would become clear a little bit later in the week. The first part of why koi are so expensive compared to other fish, for example, was starting to become clear. By observing the koi breeders' facilities, it was easy to see that this is a very specialist job with the immense amount of money, knowledge and effort required. To successfully breed and grow koi, perfect water quality is essential and I'd seen the immense investment that the breeders go to to provide those fish with clean water. Luckily, they have clean water flowing down from the mountains that surround their farms. However, it was not just as simple as filling their ponds up with that. With large numbers of fish kept inside over winter, the breeders need to filter their ponds to keep them clear and remove the fish waste. Heating was also present in many of the ponds too, allowing for growth and health of the carp. Food for the fish was another expense, and the Japanese spare no cost when selecting good all-round nutrition for their fish. Even with these factors applied, the insane cost of some koi carp didn't quite add up. I believe that there, there must be something more to this, something more than meets the eye. Around September through to December, it's time for the koi breeders to bring their fish back inside for the cold winter. This means harvesting their numerous mud ponds and finding out if the fish have grown and developed. To successfully catch the fish, a long net is dragged around the perimeter of the drained pond. As it is tightened, the fish become more visible until it's time to catch them. For the breeders, the harvest is an exciting but also nerve-wracking time. Every fish has got to be logged and accounted for in case some have been lost to predators. The fish are carried up to a waiting truck with clean oxygenated water and then driven back to the farm. What I never realise is that over time koi can actually change quite a lot. Some colours can fade, other colours can appear, the patterns can shift slightly and in some extreme cases fish can actually change varieties entirely. By this point in my trip I'd seen literally millions of koi and some big ones too and I couldn't help but think how are they actually selling them all? Now we all know that the price of things is dictated by supply and demand. Now I'd seen the supply up close but where was all the demand coming from? Who was actually buying all these fish? Asking Wesley about the fish that he'd bought already, he explained to me that he has customers all across Ireland with ponds of various sizes. He reckoned that the fish that he'd bought so far this trip, he'd find homes for in no time. Martin explained to me that although koi keeping is a relatively niche thing, when you look at the world as a whole, there are a heck of a lot of people who want to purchase Japanese koi. The biggest market to begin with in the 70s and the 80s was in the UK. That moved then on to, to Europe um, and now in the last 10 years Asia has taken over, especially customers from Thailand, from China, from Vietnam, all over Asia keeping koi is very, very popular. And the Asian customers are willing to pay exceptionally high prices for the best fish, um, as can be seen in the fish that got sold at an auction for $1.8 million the other year. The supply and demand balance was starting to make a little bit more sense, especially when I considered that most serious, professional koi dealers across the world will only stock fish from Japan, such as their belief that the quality of these fish is far superior to those bred in Israel or the USA, for example. However, a terrible disaster in 2004 threatened the entire Nagata koi industry. To learn more about this, Martin took us to the Chuetsu Earthquake Museum, We'd just driven down the mountains and out through one of the main roads um, and just was in, was in the apartment and it suddenly struck. And I have to admit that first time I thought the, um, I thought a lorry had come into the apartment. So it was so violent, but it went on for just over a minute. So then you realized it wasn't and everything crashed around us and the buildings were shaking and the ground was shaking. So being a Westerner, not used to earthquakes, it's a very unusual thing to experience. It measured magnitude 6.6 .6 and destroyed buildings and roads in and out of the mountain villages. 68 people lost their lives and almost 5,000 were injured, survivors being evacuated by helicopter. 1.3 million koi died due to electricity supply being broken and ponds being damaged. All the mountain sides were collapsed. I think nearly 95% of all the mud ponds were damaged in one way or another. 
Two and a half years later, locals were allowed to return to their homes in Yamakoshi and begin rebuilding their lives and the koi farms for which their livelihoods relied on. There's a fox walking. Really? Yeah, The next thing I wanted to learn about was koi shows and how these could have an effect on the price of individual koi. Last year, I actually visited a British koi show where people in my area display their fish to fellow fish enthusiasts. There is also a voting which takes place to award some fish with prizes, such as best in variety or grand champion. Today, Ryan and I are at the Worthing Koi Show, which sounds mad. There are actually shows dedicated to look at koi and some of them win awards and prizes and all sorts. It's a pretty mad concept, but um, for me, it's just good because we get to come along and look at some of our favorite fish. Before leaving, Ryan jokingly messaged his girlfriend asking if he could buy one of the 1,000 pound fish that he'd seen. I looked up online and some of the fish that you, we, we see at sea today, upwards of that amount of money, it's ridiculous, like 30, 40, 50 thousand pounds for a fish. <laughs> what do you think Laura's going to say? Um, I think, well, she might be interested. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat doubt it, mate. Yeah. Although I had witnessed the judging, at the time I had absolutely no idea of what the judges were actually looking for and how they were going to award prizes for the best fish. Now I've learned about different varieties and the attention to detail when looking for fish with the perfect body shape, vivid colours and balanced patterns. Back in Japan, there is an annual koi show, far larger and far more prestigious than the one I'd visited in England. Welcome to the All Japan Koi Show. This is an enormous event, with almost 2,000 koi on display. The Shinkokai is the breeders association, and they travel from the north and south of Japan to help set up the show and assist the judging. A vote by breeders and dealers is taken to determine the winners. In 2017, a 97 centimeter kahaku won the All Japan Show, taking the top spot as the world's best koi. The fish was called S Legend and bred by Sakai Fish Farm. It wasn't entered the following year, but in 2019 it was back. The fish had grown to a whopping 104 centimeters. 2019 was the 50th anniversary of the All Japan Koi Show and S Legend was expected to win Grand Champion. Mr. Sakai put the fish up for auction before the show where wealthy koi collectors gathered and began bidding. It's safe to say that no one expected bids to reach 203 million yen or 1.8 million dollars. At the show, the fish won grand champion for the second time and attracted a lot of attention from the press. So there it is. That is how a Kahaku variety of the koi carp became the most expensive live fish ever sold. A number of sources reported that S Legend actually died soon after. I couldn't get my head around how the owner must have felt. But then again, if you've got millions of pounds to spend on fish, you're probably financially secure enough not to worry that much. As amazing as it is, the story of this world record koi left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth. I had learned that most of the very expensive fish sold these days are bought by wealthy Chinese businessmen. As a, as a show of prestige and success. Whilst these overinflated prices do provide support for the Japanese koi industry, I couldn't help but feel slightly uncomfortable about people's egos becoming more important than the animals themselves. Earlier in the week, I overheard Martin discussing the topic with Wesley. In the past, people would just buy koi for the love, said Martin. Now some just buy for prestige. It's like buying a Picasso, but not liking or, or knowing anything about it. Wesley responded saying that what really matters is simply appreciating the fish, the beauty of these animals and caring for them properly. This conversation took place at Yamamatsu Koi Farm, where Chris had seen a Sankey that he reckoned would look great in his pond back home. 
After purchasing the fish, Chris spoke to us briefly and explained that he keeps fish because it's a break from his busy and stressful job. Admiring and caring for fish can bring calm and simplicity to an otherwise pressure-filled and complex existence. No amount of money past a certain point is able to do that. Some fish keeping hobbyists will probably say that you simply can't buy the best koi unless you are immensely rich. Whilst fish with rare anaesthetic attributes will fetch a higher price tag, I'm certainly more of the opinion now that the best koi is the one that makes you happy, and that could be any fish. Like music, art and all expression, it's just a matter of personal taste. We were nearing the end of our time in Ogier, and it hadn't just been the koi which we'd been impressed by. I'm not particularly adventurous when it comes to food, but on this trip, I'd tried proper sushi for the first time. You like that? Weirdly, okay. not a weird texture. Okay, I, I, I will have some salmon. Mm. I'll, I'll, yeah. Maybe say so. Can't come to Japan and not have sushi, <laughs> I suppose. Wow. I don't know why I'm so surprised. <laughs> Another first was drinking slightly too much of the Japanese speciality, sake, which is a wine made from rice. Whilst it tasted really nice, um, it did result in us singing karaoke most of the night and the rest I don't really remember. Konnichiwa! <laughs> this, man, this man wants to buy me. Will you see something? Where are you, Carl? I don't know. <laughs> On our last day in Nagata, I mentioned to Martin that I'd like to have another look at some chagoy, so he said we should go up to Marahiro Koi Farm one more time. I showed an interest in two particular fish and chose my favourite out of them. Then Rene asked the breeder Hirasawa how much that fish would cost. Now you may be wondering why after seeing so many colours and patterns of koi, I had bowled up a yellowy brown carp. Well, I'd first seen a chagoy at the Koi Museum at the beginning of the week, and I was taken by how tame and hungry it was. I understood that Marahiro Koi Farm has an impressive bloodline producing big and healthy fish, like those I had admired in his beautiful round pond. Other members of our group excitedly asked me, are you gonna buy the fish, are you gonna buy the fish? And I explained that it just depended on what the breeder's asking price was. I stopped and thought back to my original question, what brought me out here in the first place? Why are koi carp so expensive compared to goldfish, for example? Well, here I was, considering buying a big, beautiful creature to keep in my pond at home. It was our last day in Nagata, and although we started this week as a bunch of strangers, it filled me with joy to realize how we'd been brought together and become good friends all because of a shared appreciation for colourful fish. Hirasawa kindly gave me a very reasonable offer, so I decided that as a souvenir, a living, breathing memory of my trip to Japan, I would buy this fish. We waved goodbye to Rene and Martin and began the long journey home. No worries, cheers. I knew that upon arrival back home, I'd have a few weeks to work on my pond, expanding the filtration and cleaning it out in readiness for my fish's arrival. As I edit this video, my fish, now named Charlie the Chagoy, is in quarantine, being held for a few weeks at an aquatic store in England. I can't wait to go and collect it and bring it back to my pond, but that will have to wait for our next film. For now, I definitely recommend watching one of these related videos. The world of koi carp is a fascinating one, and I hope that this video interested you. Thanks for watching.